Dr. Brian Bug. Uh, Dr. Bug teaches at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is the founder and host of the Soccer History USA podcast. And if you do podcasts and you haven't heard it yet, I recommend it highly. It's very entertaining, and, and, I, and I say this with all sincerity: you learn while having fun. It really, it's a, it's a fun. It's it's almost like you know, as you're there with old ads and things like that. Period music. It's very enjoyable. And he's currently, unfortunately, that podcast is sort of on hiatus. But the good news is it's on hiatus because he's currently working on a book about early American soccer. So without further ado, Dr. Buck. Thank you very much, uh, Steve uh, and uh, Tom and everybody for putting this thing on, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk, I guess, for about 10 minutes with this presentation, and then I'm going to show some film clips. And I thought I was very excited about some of these because they're, they've probably been unseen for a long, long time, and they are probably among the oldest, I think, film clips of Americans playing soccer. Um, and then Tom came with the American Cup. And Steve now mentions the colorized film, so that, you know, hopefully you'll still enjoy them um, a little bit. A hundred years ago today, the 7th Field Artillery Regiment was uh, dug in at Exermont, France. Uh, the unit was part of the famed Big Red One, the 1st Infantry Division, and it was currently involved in the uh, Meuse-Argon Offensive, which was a, a major push and would ultimately help to, to end the war. Among the soldiers who was likely present was a 27-year-old private named Maurice Hudson. He was born in England in 1890, arrived in the United States in 1907, and enlisted in the Army 10 years later. By the early summer of 1918, Hudson had become an American citizen, and at some point after that, he was sent to Europe to join with his unit. Almost 50 years later, in 1966, he was elected to the National Soccer Hall of Fame as a builder, uh, based mainly on his work as secretary of the California Football Association and the San Francisco Soccer League from the 1930s to the 1960s. But as you can imagine, he was more than just a builder, he was also a player. And his career as an athlete and as an administrator uh, spanned an important transitional period in the history of soccer in the United States. Although the game had been played for decades prior to the conflict, the experience of war helped transform soccer from a relatively marginalized pastime into an established part of the American sporting tradition. Uh, no less a figure than Thomas Cahill declared the immediate post-war years as, quote, the most important period in the life of the game in this country, unquote, and saw them as a chance to grow the sport and increase its popularity among all Americans. By several measures, the sport took full advantage of the opportunity noted by Cahill ushering in what Colin Jones has called American soccer's golden age during the 1920s. The American Soccer League launched uh, in 1921 and within a few years attained a standard of play that rivaled that of most competitions around the world. The U.S. Federation's own National Challenge Cup also reflected substantial growth. After doubling from the first year to the second year, the number of entries remained steady between 1915 and the squad for the, the games. We don't know how many appearances he may have made in the games because I couldn't find any lineups or uh, really match reports for the US games. Uh, but he does appear in this photograph which was published in the Spalding Guide. And I think this was probably uh, in the game against Canada on June 25th because the Canadian coach is also in the photograph. So um, that's just a guess. Uh, after he returned from the war, Hudson continued to play for the Barbarians, and in 1921 the club held a banquet, presented him with a gold watch to celebrate 10 years of service. He retired from playing sometime in the 1920s, although he did try to make a brief comeback in 1928. According to one newspaper, the 37-year-old Hudson, quote, did very well at outside left, considering his ample waistline, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> I'll appreciate that. The appearance for the Hornets seemed to end his playing career, and by 1935, Hudson had been appointed secretary of the California Football Association, 
and he had begun his career as an administrator and as a builder, one that would ultimately uh, lead to the Soccer Hall of Fame. All right, so let's watch a little bit of video here. The quality goes from really bad to really pretty good, so just keep that in mind. So this first clip is what I think is of a mob football game. It starts out here with the crowd, and then you can kind of see um, the ball be kicked off from the sideline. And it looks like there's a lot more than 22 players on, on the pitch, uh, as far as I can tell. I haven't tried to count them all because the resolution is pretty poor. There are goals on the field of sorts, those kind of football, uh, gridiron football and regular football. There's a ball kicked off from over here. Uh, and then uh, as it slowly pans, you can see a, a set of figures who are look like they're kind of protecting probably the end line, which as you probably know in those 19th century games, the goal, the game would end when the ball was kicked over the opposite side's end line. So you have these soldiers in uniform, but if you kind of see, it looks like there's figures kind of evenly spaced out in a kind of defensive line, which actually is kind of interesting because it hints at some kind of strategy or tactics. So this is a match between a US team and a Canadian team, and this early stuff I was excited because I thought it was actually playing, but if you notice, they're sort of milling around on the field, so I think it's probably just before uh, they kick off. So again, the quality is not the best. Um, you can see it's a little bit more organized. The, the teams have uniforms. Uh, this was part of, a, of an international sports meet. Uh, I don't know what other nationalities were, um, were present, but certainly Canadians in the US played at soccer. There's the Canadian, I think it's the Canadian team because it was the second Canadian um, regiment. And then this, the film is bad, but there's like a few frames of what might be some playing action, but again, it's really hard to see and it goes by really quickly. So this is finally some decent footage. Uh, again, the quality isn't very good, but you can see here there's distinct uniforms, uh, pretty good crowd, uh, covered seating, uh, officers in attendance, which means that it's probably some kind of formal competition. And this was actually the, uh, the tournament of the 26th division, which was also called the Yankee division because the troops were from the from Maine and, New, and Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Uh, you'll see at the end the team in the striped shirts. The guy will have a good opportunity, but he kind of skies it over the bar. <laughs> he's sort of up here, the ball comes to him about up there, and then he he boots it over the top. Oh, <laughs> Rosed. So this is now some decent footage, um, and I think this is probably more of an informal game because they don't seem to have, they're like light and dark rather than specific soccer gear. Uh, even the shorts I think are not, not uniform. So this was probably an informal match or some kind of competition between, um, you know, maybe within a certain unit. And you can see there's not a huge crowd. It looks like just some soldiers who showed up to watch the game. But still, it's got some good action. A lot of walking. <laughs> and then this is probably the best of all. And I think this is game footage again. Um, and we see sort of formal uniforms, uh, but there's not a lot of cro a big crowd. Uh, and I think it's a couple of different sets of footage spliced together. So you can see this looks like it's a game that they're playing, and then there's going to be a kind of a weird um, set piece thing, which doesn't look like it's part of the game. This, starting here, where there's soldiers, a bunch of different people. It's almost like they set it up for the camera. This doesn't look like it's an actual <laughs> playing event. <laughs> And then it, it'll come back to the match footage. And again, I think we get to see a goal. The guy with the hat here on the left is, I think, the goal, goalkeeper. There he is. And you can see there'll be some play. And it looks like he kind of gets light, comes out a little fast, and gets lobbed at the end. Yeah, there it was. And he looks kind of pissed about it, too. But did he yell as his defenders? 
Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Well, it looks like one of his defenders yelled at him earlier, I think. All right, so that's it. Any questions? Yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure if I got it right, but I just want to ask a question regarding you gave statistics during the war about players, the number of players uh, on the U.S. side, I believe. You said. Yeah. Is there are there comparative statistics to the other sports that made you play? Yeah, um, I mean, baseball tended to be a lot more popular, um, and the popularity of soccer does sort of decrease throughout 1919. But like in January of 1919, more uh, soldiers played soccer than played baseball. That might have to do with the weather, I suspect. And then it kind of declined over time. But you do see um, at some points, like in 1918, soccer seems to be pretty popular relative to those other sports. And then, you know, when the war is over, and maybe the Americans can go back to playing what they, um, you know, sports that they're more familiar with, then things like basketball and volleyball and baseball kind of go up. So as a follow-up, I mean, I mean, the Americans' involvement in World War I was minimal in terms of the time frame. So right. I, I'm trying to understand the segue between all of a sudden there's this, well, let's play soccer, and then it goes away again. And I'm trying to understand that. What occurred? Um, well, I don't know if it goes away. I think that's part of what I was trying to say is that it does, I mean, you do get the American Soccer League and you get this increase yeah. in, um, in the cup entry. So I think there was some um, bounce, I guess we could say, and it did continue. I mean, it's not going to, it didn't, you know, overtake baseball or, or, or intercollegiate football or something in terms of popularity, but I think it did provide a boost and exposed uh, people to the game either as players or as spectators, and I think that did carry on a little bit. I mean, the Federation, if you read in the Spalding Guides, they certainly believe that it had a positive impact. Yeah, yeah you, you said that the, the game ended when the ball went over the end line. Uh, that was after the, the allotted amount of time for the game. Uh, well, in those 19th century games, they didn't really have a time. The game would just end whenever somebody scored. They, they did have posts. If you at the end, at the end of that, there were posts. So the yeah, they did try yeah, there were posts. But I, I think because there's so many people on the field, like I said, it's hard to count exactly. I mean, there are reports at some of these camps in the United States where they would play with 400 men on a side or 275 men on a side and four balls in play at the, at the same time. I mean, that that there's not 100 or 500 people on the field, but um, and then the, the way those figures are sort of spaced out makes me think that it's. Um, that it is the end line that they're protecting and not the goals, um, but it's really hard to tell. Um, I just so I can get it right, the the bit about the proportional investment by the YMCA. Did you say that baseball was the, the more, uh, there was more money put into baseball equipment, etc. But then second behind that were, were the soccer balls. Um, yeah, I think the figure I cited was they spent more money to buy baseballs. Because I, I remember the, the, in the Spalding Guides, I think it's the 1917 one, there's that image of where, which is a promotional thing, support our efforts, support our boys, send balls to Europe. Um, and and I, it's kind of the, the question you raised uh, before, which is, uh, you know, had the U.S. been in the war longer or entered earlier? It's kind of a counterfactual question, but I've always wondered if that would have exposed more people to the game for longer because we know that in Germany and France and Italy and other countries that were involved in World War One, their numbers boom in terms of participation. The game grows because of because people were playing the game in the trenches because that's what they did because when they weren't fighting they had time off and so they played. Right. Um, and the U.S. was only there at the tail end of the conflict and so they weren't exposed to the game as much and so you know they they had this. But I always wonder had they come. Early, I don't know, what's your view on that, Brian? I mean, who, it's who a nose. Yeah. yeah, I mean, more, probably there would have been more soldiers. I think there were about 2 million soldiers in the AEF, and so if the U.S. had been involved longer, that probably would have gone up, um, and then that would have meant more people had been exposed, so it's possible that the balance would have been bigger. 
it's not really an apple to apples comparison, but if you look at World War II, there was a, where we were there a bit longer, there was a similar bump which, which uh, prompted the formation of the North American Soccer Football League uh, with that same theory. All oh, Americans have been exposed to it, but both the other sports here were more fully established, and also since it wasn't trench warfare, it wasn't like the, our guys were playing during the breaks, it was a little different than we know the NA. SFL, B, whatever, uh, uh, I'm not going to get the acronym right, didn't last very long, so. Roger, uh, to switch again to a, to a different war, I just want to ask if you're familiar with the uh, game that was played between American Flyers and a French amateur team in Normandy uh, less than two months after he did. Oh, no, I had, I had no knowledge of that. Details for you. It's, um, so I think it was on July 25th, 1944. Yeah, it's, it's not the first war that the U.S. military invested in footballs either, right? There were thousands that they uh, distributed during the Civil War, both right. for the Union troops and for Confederates. But I'd love to hear more about your research methods in terms of those munitions. The list, the line items, it's really amazing. Yeah. Uh, do we have time for that, or do we need to move on? Could you just say real quick how you found, where do you find this? Uh, a lot of it was reported by the YMCA. I mean, they produced a report about the inter-allied games, and they have a lot of those figures. And there also there was um, the American Expeditionary Force held a tournament in the spring of 1919, in part to keep everybody busy, but also to provide um, teams, I guess, or champions to participate in the inter-allied games. So they reproduce a lot of this. Uh, sort of material in there. Is there anything in the National Military Archives? That's, 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 yeah, that's um, I haven't had an opportunity to look uh, too much into that. Um, I mean, the footage comes from the National Archives, so, yeah, but um, no, I haven't found a lot in terms of that uh, yet, so.